Okay. Okay, so first I'd like to uh, thank Shabnam for all the invitations to speak. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's, it's really great to, um, to have the opportunity to give a talk and, um, like this. And um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, non-vanishing of qubit Dirichlet L functions. And um, so I'm going to start a bit with a bit of motivation. So first, let me say a few things about the Riemann zeta function. Um, so here we have uh, the definition. Okay, so I'm going straight to um, the, I mean, not, not, maybe not the original, original definition, but the, the, the way uh, Riemann thought about it as a, fun, as a complex function. Um, so, so we can, we write a zeta function as the sum uh, from n equal one to infinity of one over n to the s, and s is a variable. Um, that if I write it like this, um, it makes sense to talk about a real part of s bigger than one. So that's when this um, series converges. And we can also write it as a product over all the uh, primes of uh, one minus one over p to the s, all of that to the minus one, okay? And that's coming uh, from uh, unique prime factorization. Now, um, the Riemann zeta function can be analytically continued to the complex plane with the pole at s equals one. And, and that's what, uh, one of the big uh, ideas of Riemann. Actually, what I wrote before was already known to Euler for the real, for real S. Um, and then another feature is that it satisfies a functional equation, okay? Um, that can be written very nicely if you allow for some modification of, um, of the function. So, so if you, if you, let me see if I, yeah, so if you multiply the Riemann zeta function by certain factors, okay, and you get uh, like the xi function, then the functional equation can be written as xi of s um, equals xi of one minus s. So it's very, very symmetric. And another feature that the Riemann zeta function has it, um, well, once we consider this analytic continuation that I actually didn't give you the formula for that. So it's obviously it's not, um, it's not the sum, okay? So it's a, it's a complex function that coincides with the sum where, where the sum converges, okay? But if you consider uh, the analytic continuation, and uh, you can see actually from the functional equation uh, it has to have, the Riemann zeta function has to have zeros at minus, uh, negative even integers, like minus two, minus four, etc. And, um, and then if you look at the functional equation, so again, the only thing that we need to keep in mind now is that there is a relationship between the value at s and the value at one minus s, so it's a certain symmetry. Then basically what you know, if you know what happens, for the real part of S greater than one, then you know what happens for the real part of S uh, negative. And uh, the real part of S greater than one, say you know because maybe, because you know you have the series, for example. So all this shaded area in the picture, we sort of know. But then the strip between the real part of S between zero and one, we don't know. And then the Riemann hypothesis says that we expect to have set of S to have only zeros at real part of S equals one half when you lie in the real part of S between zero and one. So that's what the Riemann hypothesis um, says. And it has very deep consequences in um, all around number theory. Um, so the, the, to, have, to, to summarize in one sentence, you can think that it has deep consequences in the distribution of prime numbers. Okay. So it, it allows you to, to give an asymptotic for the distribution of prime numbers that has a much more, much less error term than the one you can get uh, without using the Riemann hypothesis. 
Okay, so that's all I want to say about the zeta function. And the object I'm going to be concerned about in this talk is um, the Dirichlet L function. And so for that, I need to define Dirichlet character. So Dirichlet character modulo D is a function from um, the, the group of units modulo D to the complex numbers. So when I think about group of units, I think about the numbers modulo D that are combined to D, okay? And taking with the product. And I take a, a map, okay? So a group of homomorphism if you want, okay? So that satisfy multiplication. And then you extend this to all the integers by periodicity, okay? So if you know what happens between zero and D minus one, then for any number outside that, you just, Look at the number modulo d. And you set zero when uh, your number is not relatively prime to d. Okay, so a Dirichlet character modulo d can be viewed as also like a Dirichlet character modulo any multiple of d. Okay, so if you have a Dirichlet character modulo three, you can see it also as a Dirichlet character modulo six, right? As long as you have like a bigger modulus, it's like not just bigger, but also multiple, right? It, it still works. So when talking about characters, we are interested in sort of the smaller, smallest modulus you can define things. And so we'll say that the character is primitive of conductor D if D is the smallest modulo such that the character, so chi is a character modulo D, okay? And I have an example, <laughs> okay, to be concrete. So here is a very concrete example. Is a character, this is what is called a quadratic character because if you take the square of it, you get essentially one. I mean, you don't get one always because sometimes you get zero, Okay, so let's say, let's say we, you get only one or zero, okay? So you take, for any integer, you take basically what happens modulo three, okay? So if it's, it's one, if n is congruent to one mod three, minus one, if n is congruent to minus one mod three, and zero, if n is congruent to zero mod three. And you can think also in terms of a Legendre symbol. So you can think of this in, in different ways. Okay, so this is an example. So this is a primitive character um, of conductor three, okay, and is quadratic. Okay, any questions? Oh, okay, we continue. Okay, so what am I going to do with the characters? I'm going to make a generative function that is very similar to the Riemann zeta function. But instead of having one over n to the s, I'm going to write chi of n over n to the s. So each character gives me an L function of this way. And, um, and it also satisfies this, this product. Like I can also write it as a product over the primes because the characters are multiplicative. So, so this still works. Okay, and it also satisfies a functional equation like the one I mentioned for the Riemann zeta function. I'm not going to write it because it's not really our main interest, but I just know that is, we still have this symmetry between S and one minus S. And it also, I mean, I, I would like to say satisfies the generalized Riemann hypothesis, but really it's a conjecture, okay? So it's also a conjecture that is a generalized Riemann hypothesis, which has to do with the zeros of the L function. So again, the zeros that are supposed to be in this critical strip, the, the real part of S between zero and one, they are supposed to satisfy that they are exactly in the middle, okay, in terms of the real part. And again, the, Riemann, the generalized Riemann hypothesis is also, has also deep consequences uh, in number theory. And so in terms of distribution of prime numbers, um, if you want an example, it will have consequences, for example, in the distribution of the number of primes that are congruent to one mod four, say, or 
well, whatever, congruent to something, not something. Okay, so that you can study with the Dirichlet L function in the same way that the, just the regular number of primes you can study with the Riemann zeta function. And, uh, and, and here I have like a joke, <laughs> okay? So the generalized uh, Riemann hypothesis shows up everywhere. And so, um, I don't know. I, I, I just thought it was really funny to find these things uh, online. Okay. Anyway. Um, so what, what we are interested in this talk, actually, if you think about it, um, we don't have just one function. We have a family of functions, uh, like each character gives us a function. So we're going to think in terms of what happens at the point one half. So instead of thinking of the central strip real part of S equals one half, we are only going to focus at the point one half. Um, okay, so this construction about L functions can be generalized in many, many ways. And so here I'm writing like something very, very vague. So when you have like an arithmetic object, you can often associate, it, associate some L function. Um, and this L function typically will satisfy or it will, is expected to satisfy a functional equation, okay? And the functional equation will be something maybe relating S and one minus S. It's not always exactly like that, but you can normalize it. So something, something like a constant minus the variable, but you can always normalize it and um, and there is a central point that comes naturally from this uh, functional equation. So in our case, we are only going to talk about Dirichlet L function, so it's one half. And then the question is, what happens? What's the value at this central point? And so this is general philosophy that the value of the central point is zero either for a deep arithmetic reason or for a trivial reason. Okay, but not in between, <laughs> whatever that means. So what do I mean by a trivial reason is that somehow say you have minus one in the middle. I'm uh, sorry, in the middle, I want to say, you have, say you have minus one here and say, okay, here I'm, I'm talking about F bar is a dual object, but um, say for the example I gave you, okay, it, w it may be, if your character is not real, it will be the conjugate of the character, okay? The example I gave you was a character that was real because it was taking only values one minus one or zero, so it will be the same character. So it will be the same function on both sides. So one is in S, the other is in one minus S. And if you evaluate at S equals one half, you get the same on, the, on both sides. But if your sign is minus one, then obviously you have L in one side minus L in the other, so it has to be zero. So this is what will be a trivial reason. So when the, when the sign is minus one, that, that will be a trivial reason. But for the characters that I um, define, actually when they are quadratic, like the example I gave you, then this reason doesn't show up, okay? I didn't show you this, okay? But the sign is positive. And so this reason doesn't show up. And so there's a conjecture that says that actually the L function at uh, one half, the digit L function at one half when, when chi is quadratic, it should be different from zero. And so this is uh, Chodas' conjecture. And I don't remember the year it was uh, proposed, but it was later extended, like people believe in general this about general character. Uh, sorry, I don't want to say general characters, general Dirichlet characters, not necessarily quadratic. Um, but okay, it's, it's a still all of this at this level is a conjecture. Okay. Any questions? Okay, okay so to, to study this problem, um, one way of working is to consider what are called moments. 
Um, so for us, moments will mean we're going to sum this L in one half for different chi, okay? And while taking a power of, um, so L to the power of K, okay? And we, we go over all the chi's that are bounded in a certain way. So the most natural way to think about it is to bound the conductor. So you, you can, all the primitive characters that have conductor less or equal than a certain number. So I'm, I'm going to call that X, okay? And I'm going to write a star in the sum, meaning that I'm only counting primitive characters. Because if I don't count, say, I'm, um, see if I'm summing of modulus, say, bounded by, I don't know, 10, okay? The character I'll show you in the beginning, you can think of it as having modulus three or six or nine, okay? So you will be counting several times. So you just want to work with um, primitive characters. And say that we have, say that we know what happens with the first moment and the second moment. So k equals one and k equals one half. So if I use cauchy Schwartz, okay? So here I have the first moment. And then I'm gonna think here that I'm, I have L multiplied by one. Then I apply cauchy schwartz okay? So thinking that each term is L multiplied by one. So on one hand, I, I'm going to have L square, which I have here. And on the other, the other term will be the sum of ones. Well, one to the square, if you want, okay? Now, this sum of one shows up only when the original term is non-zero, okay? So if the L is equal to zero, you get zero times one, but I don't have to write that one. You can think that you have zero times zero. So essentially what you have is a sum of ones for when the character is different from zero. So you can replace it by that, okay? So the number of characters with a bounded conductor such that the L is different from zero, okay? So that is a number I may be interested in because if I'm interested in knowing, okay, when or oh, for which characters I have these, these values different from zero, well, this allows me to count. So if I flip things to the other side, I get, um, so basically dividing by the second moment and, uh, and then taking the square everywhere, I get a lower bound for the number of, uh, for the characters such that the L function in one half is different from zero, okay? So in principle, if I believe that all of them satisfy that, then I should get all the characters, okay? So I say all the characters of conductor up to X, okay? So in sum, the conclusion for, for this slide will be that, okay, so a good method to estimate the number of characters such that the L function is different from zero is to have good estimates for the first and second moment. And hopefully they will tell me something about uh, this conjecture. Okay, any question? Okay, so, so now we're interested in, in studying these moments. And um, the first two cases ha have been known for, for quite a while, actually. Um, so since 1981, they were uh, computed by uh, Utila. Okay, here the results, I should say, is they have an error term, okay? So it's not that it's except formula, okay? But it's an asymptotic and um, and there is actually conjecture um, from the 2000s, Keating and Snake use a random matrix theory to formulate a conjecture about what this moment should be in general to the power of K. And the conjecture says that asymptotically, this will be a constant times X times log of X to the power of K times K plus one over two. Okay, so say the cases we are always looking at is k equals one and k equals two. So what this says is that, um, so for k equals one, it will be just log of x. 
And for k equals um, 2, it will be log of x to the cube. Um, then uh, in, in the 2000s, there was uh, some um, really uh, important work by uh, Sandor Ashen. Um, he found, for example, for the formula k equals 2, he found a secondary main term. So what it means is that, okay, a term with, um, with lower power of log, okay? And then also uh, he gave formula for k equals 3. And then for k equals 4, there are formulas that are uh, known by, um, well, the, the big, big breakthrough was uh, Sandoration and Young, but using the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So this is assuming the Riemann hypothesis for the Dirichlet functions. Um, now, with these results, if you go back and you plug it into this, um, uh, the cauchy shorts inequality, what you get is that the non-vanishing Okay, so the number of uh, characters that are, um, that give L function different from zero is X over log of X. And this is, okay, so it means that there are infinitely many, is good, but what it also means is that as X goes to infinity, the proportion actually goes to zero, because the total number of um, characters is like x, okay? So the proportion of the number of characters that you can guarantee that is different from zero divided the total number of characters goes to, is like one over log of x, okay? And so this goes to zero. So it's not such a satisfactory result from that point of view. Um, I should say, and we'll come back to this um, later, that actually Sandor uh, also in 2000, developed a final method to prove that actually positive proportion. So positive proportion is he got the result that there is at least seven eight of the characters have the L function that don't vanish, okay? So again, this is, this is a positive proportion that doesn't go to zero as it goes to infinity. Why? If you use, um, if you use the, the moments, the classical moments, you don't get this. Okay. Any questions? Um, okay. Okay, so what I'm going to be interested, especially in this talk, has to do with cubic characters. Um, I'm not going to discuss cubic characters right now. Um, I want to just focus later on cubic characters when we talk about function fields. Um, so I'm not going to define them, but basically a cubic character is like, is okay, so it's a Dirichlet character such that if you raise it to the Q, you get either zero or one. So we, of, we write often X to the Q equals one, but it's not really, it, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to say that you cannot get zero. I mean, we saw that you'll always get zero for the values that are not co-prime with the conductor, okay? But all the other values that are non-zero, okay, they are going to be third roots of unity. Okay, that's basically what a cubic character is and it satisfies all the definition that I gave you before, okay? And so the question is, um, what is known about cubic characters? Okay, much less is known. I mean, I gave you in the last slide, I gave you about quadratic characters. Did I mention quadratic? <laughs> okay, but all the last slide was about quadratic, and for that we knew k equals one, k equals two, k equals three, and k equals four using GRH, and, and also good conjecture, okay? For cubic characters, well, we can also formulate the conjecture, but what is known in, or what is proven um, is only things with k equals one, okay? So for k equals one, what happens with cubic characters is that um, there are other factors that come into play. Because the third roots of unity are involved, you in principle have 
different behavior, whether you have the third root of unity involved in your base field or not. So the most natural question is the one coming from our definition is working over the rationals. And over the rationals, you don't have the third root of unity. And the first moment for cubic characters was computed by uh, Bayer and Young, 2010. And they found that um, the first moment is asymptotically a constant times x, okay? And the number of characters is also constant times x. Okay, so that's a little bit to give you an idea of what, what one gets. Um, but if you add, say, artificially, a third root of unity, I mean, not artificially, but if you want to think about in terms of, okay, what if the third root of unity is in the base field, you can work with uh, I mean, it's Heke characters, not exactly Dirichlet, okay, but you can think that you are working um, on the ring of integers of Q adjoint as the root of unity, okay, and define characters there in a similar way to what I did before. And then you are going to count all the characters whose the conductor is going to be an element in the ring of integers of the third root of unity, but you can take the norm and bound that, okay? And then the number of characters like that is going to be a constant times x times log x, okay? So there are more options because, okay, I'm gonna explain this actually when, when I talk about function fields, but th there are more options because it's like, each prime is like instead of having a quadratic symbol, like the le legendre symbol, in this case, you have like each prime has two characters, one character and the conjugate. And so basically you end up with more characters. And the only result that uh, we know in this direction is a result of Luo where he actually um, doesn't count exactly the first moment. He counts the first moment in a restricted family um, that somehow he's ignoring. Um, uh, so he's, he's taking like um, one character for each pair of characters that you can take for each prime. So he's talking about, uh, it's kind of a square free uh, conductor. And so he gets a constant times x even though one would expect, so for the whole family, one would expect the result to be x times log x. Uh, so this is what is known about the, um, the first moment. And uh, these results will imply the same kind of, um, yeah, the same kind of quality of non-vanishing results. So not, not uh, nothing new there. And uh, okay. So now I'm going to talk about, so the goal of this talk is to talk about function fields. So our results are in function fields and what it means is that we don't work over the rationals. We're going to work about polynomials over a finite field, okay? So for me, I'm going to work with the final field FQ of Q elements, okay? And Q is the power of a prime. Um, if you haven't seen this, you can think of the integer modulo a prime. Uh, so it's say like the integer modulo seven, I don't know. So that's a field. And uh, so it's a kind of thing, but uh, more general than that. Um, and in this context, you can actually build a whole theory of arithmetic that is very similar to what you get over the rationals and integers. The way to think about is that instead of having the integers, now you think about polynomials with coefficients in this field. While the rationals, you can think of it as the fraction field of the integers, and then you have the rational functions on, as a, a fraction field of these polynomials. Then instead of having the positive primes, okay, you get the monic irreducible polynomials, okay? So here, uh, if you don't take monic, it's like taking the primes and the negative primes, okay? So I'm thinking about in terms of generators for ideas. So in terms of ideas, then you, are you, you just keep the monic polynomials. Um, you can talk about norm. 
Okay, so in the, in the integers, it will be just the absolute value, okay, but it's also defined as the number of elements if you take z mod nc. And with the polynomial, you can do exactly the same thing. You can quotient by the ideal generated by the polynomial. And then the number of elements is q to the degree of f. So this is going to be the norm of f of t, so the norm of this polynomial. Then you can, you can build the, um, the Riemann zeta function. So on the, on the left-hand side is the function I already talked about. On the right-hand side, so instead of summing of n equals one to infinity, you want to sum over all the monic polynomials, okay? And you take one over the norm of f to ds. Okay, and you can, you can build a theory with that. And the magic thing that happens here is that the Riemann hypothesis is true. And so for this particular, for the Riemann zeta function defined like that, you can actually prove it. Okay, so here I'm gonna prove it. So here is the Riemann hypothesis, uh, sorry, the Riemann zeta function, okay? So again, it's a definition that I gave you before. And, uh, and again, you can write it as a product of one minus one over uh, a prime to the power of s. Now, if we look at just the left-hand side, okay, so the sum over all f monic of one over the norm of f to the s. So let's write what it is. I mean, the norm of f is just q to the degree of f, so we can write what it is, okay. And now, it only depends on the degree of f. So let's count the number of polynomials that have certain degree, okay? So if you take the polynomials with degree d, okay? And I'm, I'm always talking about monic, okay? So you have d coefficients to choose, okay? And each of them has q possibilities because you are in a finite field. So you get q to the d polynomials. Okay, so you are, there are only q to the d polynomials of degree d. And so instead of summing over polynomials, they sum over all the possible degrees. So we sum from d equals zero to infinity. And, uh, and we count the number of terms that we have with one over q to the sd. And that number of terms is given by q to the d, which is the number of polynomials that have that degree. And then you apply the geometric, um, series summation and you get one over one minus q to the one minus s okay and that's the zeta function here so it's very very nice um maybe too nice okay so basically well it's obvious where the where the zero <laughs> there are no zeros okay and we have a pole at s equals one and so it kind of it's a little bit underwhelming okay but the the theory is not at all, I mean, you can work with extensions of field extensions of um, FQT, and then it becomes much more interesting. Now, I want to talk about the Dirichlet functions there, okay? So we're going to build Dirichlet characters in the same way that uh, we did before. So basically, we take our polynomials, modulo a fixed polynomial that I'm going to call D here, Okay, and again, we, we construct the same thing, okay? So we consider all the uh, homomorphisms of, uh, of this ring to the complex numbers, okay? And we can extend it by uh, periodicity. And again, we're going to say that uh, chi of A is zero if A is not confined to D. And so we can do exactly the same thing we can go now and fit that into the coefficients of the Riemann zeta function and make a Dirichlet L function, okay? And here we can be smart and use a little bit of the trick that we were using before, okay? Of, okay, let's count by degree of polynomial. And when you do that, you end up with this side of the equation, okay? So it's the sum of n equals zero to infinity, one over q to the n s, and the coefficient is a sum of the characters over all the polynomials that have degree n. Now, if you think, okay, I didn't discuss this before, 
But if you think about, say, the example that I gave you, the, the most basic example that I gave you with the quadratic character um, of conductor three, that was taking the values one minus one and zero, okay? What happens is that if you sum the, the value of the character at zero, one, and two, you get zero, right? Because you get zero plus one plus minus one. Now, this is part of a very general phenomenon that is called character sum. And when you have a, what is called a full character sum, you get, um, you get zero unless things are uh, trivially, unless everything is one, let's say. Uh, so in this case, what happens is that if you're summing over polynomials that have degree larger than what we call the conductor, then we're going to get zero. Okay, and so basically the, the, this Dirichlet L function, even though in principle it's an infinite sum, it's actually a finite sum. It only goes for, for degree less than the degree of D. Okay, so I'm not really going to use this much, but it's just kind of behind uh, many ideas that I will describe. Now, what is this, this in concretely? Okay, so if we want to think concretely about quadratic Dirichlet characters over function fields, we can talk about the Legendre symbol again. Okay, and we can extend things. Um, so not just conductor prime, but also if we want to extend to a product of, con of primes, we can use the Jacobi symbol. Uh, so this you can also do over the integers, okay? I didn't do it in detail, um, but here to give you an idea that, um, I mean, for example, this is how you build quadratic characters, okay? So this will be one minus one, so again, the Legendre symbol. And there is quadratic reciprocity, like in the case of the classical Legendre symbol, okay? And so often in our computations, we like to flip a lot between the conductor and the function where we, and the polynomial where we're evaluating. So often we ask um, things that will guarantee that we can flip. So we get rid of the sign. And here I'm missing kind of an equal <laughs> there, okay. But basically if you ask, for example, Q congruent to one mod four, then all the sign disappears. So often we ask these conditions. Okay, and what is known for um, moments of quadratic Dirichlet L functions? Well, again, it's a conjecture, okay? And here when we talk about, um, so before we used to bound the conductor, in here we are going to fix the degree of the conductor. But talking about degree makes sense when we talk about quadratic characters, but not so much when we talk about cubic characters. So I'm going to talk to mention something that's called the genus, but I don't have time to explain what the genus is, but you can think of it as the degree. So in this formula, the degree is 2g plus one, and I'm summing over things that have fixed degree 2g plus one, if you want. So this is a conjecture, but then, there are results, so for k equals one is known, and actually much more. Actually for k equals two, three, and four, again, the moments have been com um, computed, a little bit like the picture that I explained before over the integers. And in fact, also there are results about non-vanishing, like with positive proportion, okay, by uh, Bu and Florea. But <laughs> there are also results for vanishing. <laughs> okay, so um, there is a um, um, result by Lee, Wang Lin Lee, uh, from 2018. She proved that there is vanishing. Now, the vanishing has proportion that again goes to zero when G goes to infinity, okay? So here I wrote, it's a one third here. So the exponent of the proportion, the exponent of the vanishing is smaller than the number of characters. The number of characters is like Q to the 2G plus one, okay? So, so this goes to zero, but it's still 
there. So Chola conjecture is not true here, okay? But the question remains, it's not the same saying that 100% of the characters are no, um, have non-zero L value as saying that all the characters have non-zero value, okay? So here, is, is, the proportion goes to zero, but still is there. Okay, so what about cubic characters? Okay, so for cubic characters, we have, um, again, we have the two cases that I mentioned before, because you could have the roots of unity, the cubic roots of unity in your base field or not. And in this case, the distinction is less obvious. Because before, obviously, the rationals don't have the cubic roots of unity, so you have to add them. But here, depending on the congruence of Q, you have the roots of unity or not. So if Q is congruent to one mod three, you, can, you have the roots of un, the cubic roots of unity. And so you define the character um, but taking, so for a monic irreducible P, you can define the character F, but taking F to the um, degree, Q to the degree of P minus one over three. So it's like the, it's like the norm of P. So this is like, um, sorry. So this is like the norm of P here. So to the norm of P minus one over three, and because Q is congruent to one mod three, Q to the degree of P minus one is multiple of three. So it makes sense to divide by three, okay? And this gives you some polynomial in a sense, okay? That you can understand as um, modulo P, okay? And you can look at whether it's a cube or not. So the basically morally is that, okay? So you are looking, it's again like the quadratic symbol, okay? But you can look at things whether there is a cube or not. And, um, and again, here you can do construction with um, the Jacobit symbol to extend. So it's not just modulo P, you can go modulo any uh, product of times. Okay, so in sum, to, to form a cubic character in here, you kind of, you kind of have to relate each uh, polynomial modulo P with some third root of unity. And so you related modulo P with the third root of unity, and then you make a map to the complex numbers, and you go to the roots of unity in the complex numbers. Now, if Q is congruent to two mod three, you cannot always do that because say, or like in here, the degree of P minus one is not necessarily multiple of three. So the only case in which you can do that is when the degree of P is even because then you have Q squared, which is congruent to one mod three. So Q congruent to two mod three, you can form a character when P has even degree. And this thing you can actually understand in, if you, in terms of uh, field extensions. So the P that have degree even over the, so the polynomials on coefficients of FP that have degree of Q, sorry, that have degree even, are those that actually split when you go to the field, the degree, the extension of degree two FQ squared over T. So when you consider polynomials, now with coefficients over uh, FQ squared, and those are the ones that factor into two terms. So actually these characters can be interpreted as characters coming from a FQ squared, um, in FQ squared. So polynomials that have um, coefficients in FQ squared with the same construction that I had before. Um, okay, so what do we have with these two characters? Well, our results, um, we, have, we have one result for each case, so Q congruent to one mod three and Q congruent to two mod three. Um, so for Q congruent to one mod three, essentially we have um, a formula that is G times Q to the G plus one. Okay, so remember how I say, I'm not going to define what genus is. 
But in the quadratic case, you can think of genus as 2G plus 1. Well, in this case, for the Q congruent 1 mod 3, you can think of the degree to be G plus 1. It's actually, again, not exactly, but um, that's a good approximation. And then for Q equal congruent to 2 mod 3, the degree will be like G plus 2. So that's why you see the G plus 2 in the exponent and the G plus 1 in the exponent that can keep in the powers of um, Q there. Um, and the thing that to notice here, the difference between these two results is that this one has a uh, size G, Q to the G plus one, and this one has size just uh, Q to the G plus two. Okay, so G goes to infinity. It's like the degree of your, the conductor of the character goes to infinity. So, so G times Q to a G is grows much faster than Q to a G, just Q to a G, okay? Um, and then, okay, so there's some technical condition here is how um, we are counting the, the characters, uh, those that are um, what restrict in the base, uh, in the base field restricted in a certain way, but that's, it's really technical. It's not, it's not going to change the size. It just, it makes it easier to count. Okay. Also the error terms are, are kind of different. And uh, so that was a big deal when, yeah, we, we didn't want to have one plus the square root of seven over four, but uh, we couldn't do better than that. Um, okay, so, let me just mention a few, um, yeah, a few features about these results, okay? So for the non-cumer case, the case where Q congruent to two mod three, this is analogous to the result of Bayer and Young. And the, the size is Q to the G, like I said. And with Bayer and Young, they have size X. So this Q to the G that we have here translates as the X that we had before. So basically it's, it's, it's a similar result. For the Kummer case, we don't have anything to compare to because Luo result was kind of restricted. So it was a restricted family. Um, so what we get is G times Q to the G, and this is like X times log of X, which is a number sort of the order of the number of characters. So it's a good, it's good news, okay? But uh, yeah, we, we cannot compare. Uh, the, this case, like I guess, is, it's quite complicated actually to, that's why we get such a complicated error term. And uh, both proofs involves um, the approximate functional equation, uh, Perron formula, Lindelof bounds, and cubic Gauss sums. Um, so maybe I just, I'm going to go a little bit quicker here uh, because I want to also talk about the most recent result. Um, the approximate functional equation has to do Sorry, with... before you go ahead, can I ask you to go to the previous page? I just wanted to mention, do you, uh, you showed pictures of people. These are your collaborators. Oh, sorry. Their names are not written here, so maybe you can tell their names. Sorry, yes. So this is <laughs> Chantal Davin, and this is Alexandra Floria. So I actually mentioned many, many results by uh, Alexandra Floria before. <laughs> she, she was everywhere. Um, and all the results that had to do with function fields um, in these moments. Yeah, thanks Shabnam for pointing that out. I should add their names. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Now, okay, so I wanted to mention, okay, so uh, one of the, the typical steps in this type of thing has to do with um, exploding the functional equation in a kind of weird way that somehow, you know, you can think of the functional equation as something that flips between chi and chi bar, okay? These are cubic characters, so the, the chi bar is a conjugate, okay? And, uh, and when S equals one half, S and one minus S are the same, but the chi changes between chi and chi bar, and there's also the sign of a functional equation. So you somehow you flip half of the terms, but not all of them. So this is what is called the, um, the, the approximate functional equation. And, um, and the main term, so for the asymptotics, is going to come from the part that is non-flipped. Um, 
Okay, so basically what happens is that the part that is not flip, you can, you can extract the, um, the terms where the conductor of the character is a cube. And, uh, and here I, I flip it with cubic reciprocity actually, but I mean, the, so you can think of this as also small f evaluated in big F with cubic reciprocity. And then uh, what ends up happening is that, yeah, if there is a cube involved in either like small f or big F, you end up essentially having either one or zero. And, and so you, you estimate that part. And so that's, this is the part that what I wrote sum over the f equal cube. And, uh, and so that ends up giving um, the main term, okay, the q to the g or q to the, or g times q to the g in the case of, um, of Kummer, okay. And then uh, the Lindelof bound, we use it to bound the sum in the principal that are non-cubes. And let me just say the Lindelof bound, I'm, I'm not explaining what that is, but it's some estimate of the, the size of L function um, uh, near, near one half and is coming from the Riemann hypothesis. It's a consequence of Riemann hypothesis. So in this case, it's good because we know Riemann hypothesis and we know the Lindelof bound and we know lots of things. Okay, like I said, we proved the Riemann hypothesis, but I mean, in general, if we could uh, try to, to translate this proof to the, over the uh, number field case, and then it will be dependent on the Riemann hypothesis. And then the, the term with, things are flipped with the chi bar, this is called a dual, and this term is, is the most difficult to estimate, and the estimate uses what is called a cubic Gauss sum. So the typical Gauss sum it will be a sum with an additive character and quadratic character. Um, this is with a cubic character. And the, the behavior is, hmm, chaotic and so they are hard to estimate. So it's a lot of work um, to estimate things there. Um, okay, so basically this is kind of the main ideas of the proof. Uh, I didn't mention what Perron formula was, but um, it's essentially the residue theorem um, that you use to estimate generating function. So, um, so you have a sum, you build a generating function out of it, you understand this generating function, say as a rational function, and you use uh, a residue theorem to, to recover the original sum that you want as a residue on, over some of this, integrating this, this generating function. Um, so it's, it's very cool. Now, um, now the result I wanted to talk uh, mostly today involves what I just said, so I couldn't really uh, skip it. Um, so if we go, if we try to use what I just said to estimate non-vanishing, well, actually, we can bound the quadratic moment by g times q to g, okay? So everything I'm going to say from now on is q congruent to two mod three, so the non-Kummer case. So the first moment is q to the g, and the second moment is we can bound it by g times q to the g. But then if you do the trick with the Cauchy-Schwarz formula that I gave you before, um, well, the non-vanishing you get is q to the g over g. And so this is bad because the number of characters is q to the g, so that means that the proportion of non-vanishing Again, it's one over G, okay? So, so it's something that goes to zero when G goes to infinity, okay? So again, the Miramanyo G is like a size, it's like the degree of, the, of your conductor, if you want. Okay, so it's something, um, so it's, again, this result, like the ones I, most of the ones I describe and all the ones I describe with cubic, again goes to, um, the, the non-vanishing proportion goes to zero. Now, the, our new work has to do with working with something that's called the mollified moments, okay? And this is um, an idea that was um, due to Sounderation, 
he considered, instead of considering moments, and the classical way, he considers the modification of the moments. Okay, so we're going to multiply this, my L function by M, okay? And M is a function that, roughly speaking, approximates the inverse of um, L. O obviously, when L is different from zero. But, um, okay, so you, you kind of multiply by something that can makes each term to be close to one or zero, okay? And so, for the first moment, let me remind you, we used to have Q to the G and the total number of characters, also Q to the G, okay, with some constants. The constants, we don't care, okay? Now, if we multiply by this, we still, it's like counting the number of characters. So we still get Q to the G, but then for the second moment, if we are smart enough, we can get, again, the number of terms that we are summing, no matter what moment, is Q to a G, right? So if we are smart enough and divide by something that makes the terms, each individual term close to one, we should get Q to a G instead of G, Q to a G. Okay, and so here's a brilliant idea. So multiply by something that makes Q to a G instead of G, Q to a G. Okay, and with that, we get the result and the plus plus means that we're still um, uh, writing the final details. Well, I mean, the details are there. We're trying to write the paper to put it together, okay? So we have that for Q congruent to two and three, we actually have positive proportion. Okay, so this C is a positive constant, very small very small, but positive. Um, okay, so the proof involves combining ideas of many, many people. So one idea, so the first idea has to do with um, bounding. Okay, so each of these terms, this absolute value of L, Okay, we know that these L's are polynomials, but they have, I mean, not polynomials, but they are sums of length G, okay? But then making this sounds much shorter, okay? So not length G, but then a small constant and G, okay? So the idea is, so this is result um, by Sandorajan and also um, a function field by, um, version by Bui, Floria, Kitting, and Roditi Gershon, where they bound the log of L, but some arbitrary sum. Okay, so this is sum is up to N, and the N I can't choose. So if I take N close to G, okay, this number is one or whatever, some normal number, and this is like a long sum. But I can take also in smaller, okay? So this number will grow, but maybe in a way I can control, and then this sum will be smaller. And, and then, well, if I take the exponential, I can get a, a sum, a bound for the log, for the k power of L. And in here, also, I'm doing some other estimate, okay? It turns out that this sum that I have originally, the main term that contributes is the sum when I take only the primes. So, so here I'm just writing the primes, which are the monarchy reducer polynomials, and all the other things, I can actually put them together in a small stuff, okay? Now, small stuff is, okay, I'm rushing things under the carpet here. I mean, with the, the, the sum of the square of the primes is, um, it actually takes some work to bound, okay? And uh, we use ideas of Harper there, I didn't write it, but um, that is non-trivial. And then the rest of the time we spend uh, bounding this thing with the, the sum over the primes. And the idea here is that this N is going to be small multiple of G, well, G plus two, technically. And we are going to split the interval where the primes, so the primes are, primes of degree up to n, okay? But we are going to split this interval in a certain way, okay? In a number of intervals that is kind of variable and goes to infinity, but 
the number is log log g. So it goes to infinity, but not very fast compared to what g is. Okay. And, and so basically, this exponential that we want to kind of bound. So again, let me go back a minute. Okay, so we want to bound the sum of this with k equal to, but we do it in general for k. Okay, but um, so in order to do that, we want to sum to bound the sum of the primes. Okay, and so we're going to split the primes to separate the primes in different intervals. Okay, and in each of these intervals, sometimes the sum is small. And sometimes it's not. Okay. So when the sum is small, we can bound the exponential with something that is like a finite exponential. So it's a partial sum of the exponential. And when the sum is not small, okay, so when this thing is big, what you can actually do is you, you keep it there, but then you sum over the chi's for which the sum is big, and then the average becomes small. So that's kind of the idea. Okay, so I'm, I'm writing some very vague ideas here. Okay, um, so for example, say that you want to sum, so here I'm doing the sum when I cannot bound by this finite exponential anywhere. So all the intervals are kind of bad. And so this is still the, the, this, well, the K moment that I want to bound with the modifier, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by something that is actually bigger than one. So it's kind of weird, I want to bound. So the first thing is I, I add a bunch of terms and I also multiply by something that's bigger than one. And then I use cauchy schwarz to separate the L function from the rest. And this is very funny because the L function that I get here is again the 2K moment. So it's like I'm one to one the K moment, I somehow take things away with the 2K moment. And the 2K moment, I have this bad bound that I have from the beginning. So it's actually Q to the G, Q to the uh, times G is K squared. So, so when K equals one, which is a case I was caring about. Okay, this gives you G times Q to a G. So it's this bad bound that I had before. But then the, the, the interesting part is the second part. So in here, actually, because of how things are chosen and how the polynomials are split, etc., I have a saving. So I have Q to the G divided by something that kind of, well, is small, but explodes is Q to the log G with some positive power of log G. So that thing that device kind of kills whatever I have here, my power of G. Okay, so that's basically a story. So in principle, something that was supposed to give you G multiplied by Q to the G, okay? You separate it and one of the parts kills the G on the other side. Um, and then, so one question is how we do this sum over the characters. Um, so I, as I was saying, like something that is behind there is that when you do the sum of the characters, the thing becomes small. So the sum of the characters is actually very cute. So I wrote the idea here because it's, um, it's really nice. So you are, you put, you still keep together all your intervals. And um, so here B and C are some multiplicative functions. And basically what happens is that, okay, so on this side you have the sum of the characters. Now, what happens is the same trick that I mentioned before, basically, you care about the main term is when the conductor is a Q somehow. And basically here something again happens that when you have a full character sum and you don't have a Q conductor, then things get zero. 
So in order, so the only terms that survive is when something is acute. And the cute thing is that because the, the polynomials are in different intervals, and this interval has to do with the degree of the polynomials, and you are choosing the primes in different intervals. So a prime that is in one interval cannot be helped by primes in other intervals to, to become a cube, because the prime can only belong to one interval, and the other primes are co-primes because they are different. <laughs> So basically, it's like you have to have a cube in each interval. So, so basically, that kind of uh, behind. So it, it it gives a lot of restrictions, and uh, that's that's how you get um, a little bit of how you get all this uh, cancellation thing. Okay, so basically, these are the ideas. So the result, I I have to tell you what the constant is. Okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> very small. <laughs> um, I half an hour before starting this talk, I realized what we never computed the the constant for the number of characters. I, I keep saying it's q to the g, right? But q to the g multiplied by constant, we have a formula for it, but I don't have the numerical thing, and so I I, I should divide by that number to give you the proportion. I don't I don't have it in this talk. Okay, I just have the total number, but I mean, the number of the characters is, is, is a normal number. What, <laughs> it's, a, it's a human size number. So to get the proportion, you will have to divide 2.56 um, e to the e to the minus, uh, sorry, e to the minus e to the 185 by some, by say 10, whatever. Okay, the whole point is that e to the minus e to the 185 is really, really small. So I was trying to estimate, to understand how small this is. And uh, so here's the part that kind of, um, uh, so, so I, used to, I like, I, I'm a big fan of Rubik's Cube. And so I, and I, I like uh, all things about Rubik's Cube. So one thing that you can have is there is a formula for the number of movements that you can do in an n by n by n Rubik's cube, okay. So e to the e to the 185 is a number is about the number of positions of a Rubik's cube whose side has length five times ten to the 39. <laughs> so somehow I understand this number better than the other, but I don't know. I mean, it's huge. Like if you have a Rubik's cube of size seven, you get the number is that has more position than the number of games of chess. The Rubik's cube of size six has more position than the number of atoms in the universe. So this is seven is chess, six is the universe, and five times ten to the thirty-nine is a denominator we have. That's how small it is. Um, yeah. So that is positive. <laughs> I mean, the whole point is that is a constant that it doesn't go to zero as the degree of the conductor goes to infinity. Okay, so it is positive, it's just very, very, very small. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my talk. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. And, uh, and today is a special day. I did, I have to confess, I didn't realize when I picked the date that today was, um, was uh, Women in Mathematics Day which is actually in honor to the birthday of uh, Maria Mr. Kani. Um, she, she was a very, uh, not, not just an outstanding uh, mathematician, but also an outstanding person. Um, so I wanted to end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matilda. Are there any questions? I just wanted to say that uh, Derek Garten from Portland State was here, but he had to leave at 11. So she, he just sent a message and thanked you. And he said he has to leave, but he was here for most of the time. Okay, thank you. Gonna, Any questions from audience? Gonna, yeah, I have a question. Um, and I might, have, I might have missed this earlier in the talk, but when we're looking at, um, the value of one of these L series at the particular uh, S value of one half. Does that tell us something about um, the value of the L series at 
other points on the on the line real part of s equals one half 